All right, that's not, I think we could get uh, started pretty much. Liz, you're here, I believe, right? I am here, yes, hello. Awesome, cool. I think Taylor, feel free to get started. We could just go to the agenda slide. Right now I have uh, Brendan, Brian and, and Joe Beta not attending, but all the other TOC members are here. So we have six out of nine attending and quorum is met. So feel free to take it over, Liz, if you want to, here's the agenda. I guess I could, yeah, why not? Uh, hello, everyone. Oh, let's move on pretty quickly because uh, I'm sure we want to spend the time on the presentations. Uh, yes, yeah, so the storage SIG pull request. Um, who wants to make any comments about whether that is ready to vote on? <laughs> I think Quinton or Alex Tricot maybe want to speak to this. I think the charter is ready. So to kind of formalize that the TOC needs to vote on it. So if there's no opposition uh, from the TOC, I could kick off a vote um, today, but maybe Alex or um, Quinton want to speak sure. to this? So, so just by way of background, um, uh, the storage working group um, had produced um, some content and had been involved in um, dragging some parts of the community. And obviously we want to kind of take this further um, and we have another some other initiatives in mind that we're also currently running a survey with the end user forums. Um, so we put together um, a charter modeled on the, um, on the SIG charter that was uh, approved by the TOC and Jiang Li is, um, is kind of offered to be the, the TOC liaison. Um, and we have, um, we have a number of people that have, not, that, that have put themselves forward for the chair and tech lead positions. Um, so I guess what we were kind of looking for is some guidance to actually formalize this and make it real. Um, the, the SIG charter requires a, a TOC votes to, to sort of um, formalize it. Um, and I kind of asked Chris if we can get that done this, uh, this meeting, yeah. so it would be the advocate part. Okay, um, I know that um, Quinton and Alexis were very involved in drafting the, you know, the uh, the processes for SIGs. Um, Alexis, you're here. Have you got any comments about this, or do you think it's ready for going to a vote? You're Alexis? on mute, Alexis. You're here. <laughs> He's on mute. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm happy for us to vote on this. I think that okay. um, in the past when we voted, people have often taken it a bit more seriously and brought out some last minute questions, which we can account for during the process. And also we've pretty, been, been pretty good about fixing problems with a 1.1 release as well. So let's just vote. Any other comments on that? I think we should go ahead and do a vote then. Yeah, I'll, right. I'll take an action item to do that after, after this meeting. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Over to whoever is presenting cloud events. Whoever, yes, that'd be me, I'm Doug. Um, so because, yes, we have some new, <laughs> because we have some new TOC members, I decided to give a little bit of background on why the cloud events project got started and stuff. If you guys are already familiar with this, don't hesitate to stop me and I'll skip it. But I figured just in case I try to cover it for you guys. Um, so basically, why cloud events? So we were trying to solve this problem of many people live in a multi-cloud world, multi-service world, where events are flowing back and forth across environments. And in particular, in multiple ways, um, different transports, um, different mechanisms for transmitting the events. And there really wasn't a consistent way for receivers of the events to actually be able to, um, without some, some specialized logic, to to be able to process the events, not necessarily from a business logic perspective, but from simplistic sort of um, middleware perspective, right? How to get the event to the actual function, as an example, to process it, right? If the middleware, for example, want to do some sort of advanced filtering, more often than not, it would have to understand this, oh, this was an S3 event as opposed to some other kind of event to be able to do the filtering. And people were looking for some sort of interoperability around this space. And so that's kind of why cloud events sort of 
got started. And just as a quick little graphic here, um, this was one of, the, so the, one of our first demos to represent this exact problem where we had two different event sources, AWS and Azure blob stores, going through different gateways, sending out events to all the various subscribers in the middle. And they would probably have to be able to, or they would probably have to write specialized code depending on the event coming in, just to do some basic filtering, right? To know where to look in each one based upon whether it's coming from AWS or Azure on whether they even want to process the event in their business logic or not. And so what Cloud Events was able to do was to try to harmonize that and try to make life a little bit easier for people. So let's move on to the next slide. So how we're going to be doing this or how we did this, what we looked at doing was basically defining a set of common metadata across events. And the way I kind of tend to look at this is we were doing for events what HTTP did for simple uh, message exchanges, meaning HTTP at a very high level is very basic. It's just a set of headers, a blank line, followed by random data in the body, right? <clears throat> but the commonality of those HTTP headers allows for some very powerful yet simplistic things like basic routing, right? And sharing of a location of where metadata can be found if you do get agreement on what particular metadata you're looking for. And so we kind of follow a similar pattern here, right? By defining some common metadata that appears in all events, you can at least allow the infrastructure to do some basic transport or movement type logic of your events. And so we're defining some common metadata without changing the business logic, <clears throat> meaning we don't get into this common pitfall that a lot of people get into, which is defining yet another global common event format that everybody has to adhere to. We decided we're just looking at extra metadata, not touching the actual business logic itself. And of course, we're doing this all to help facilitate integration and interoperability across platforms with sort of a bigger goal of hopefully looking at uh, portability of functions themselves between platforms, by, because if everybody can, for example, assume a cloud event is coming in as opposed to just some random event, you may be able to get a little bit of better interoperability and portability of your functions across the various platforms. So those are sort of the high level goals and the whys of why we're doing this. Uh, we were approved as a sandbox project um, back in December, 2017, as a result of the serverless working group. Um, for the, and for those of you who don't know, the serverless working group was basically started up to do some investigation around serverless in terms of what does the CNCF want to do, if anything, around serverless. And so we produced a white paper, a landscape doc, you know, general stuff like that. But one of the outcomes of the white paper was some recommendations for the TOC around possible areas of interop and harmonization. And one of the low hanging fruits was events. And so uh, as a result of that, the TOC voted and said, okay, go look at what you can do around eventing. And that's how cloud events kind of got started. All right, and obviously, if you have any questions, please jump in and ask them anytime. Otherwise, I'll just keep rambling at laser speed. Um, all right, so overview of what the spec itself is. It's actually a very simplistic spec. As I said, it's just what common kind of metadata do we want to see in all, in all events to be, able to, call, to be able to be called a cloud event. And if you look at this list, the first four that are in bold are really the only ones that are required. Everything else is optional. And they're not exactly you know, rocket science here, right? Every event gets a unique ID, um, a unique source, which is basically a URL saying where this event came from, uh, the cloud event spec version, and then the type. And you can think of type as the, the, uh, the type of event, right? So is it a create versus a delete kind of a thing? Very basic stuff. Things that almost every single event should have anyway, so it's in there. Now the other optional attributes are things that are useful, but may not necessarily be required for all events. <clears throat> things like, the subject, right? What is this event about as opposed to where did it come from? The time it was generated. Uh, information about the payload, right? The, the content encoding, the schema of the payload, things like that. that are useful, but not necessarily always going to be there. So at a most basic level, you could think that any message that's flowing around the system could be turned into a cloud event by just adding those four top level properties. And we'll get into a little bit of what that might look like in a second. But once, you, once we define those properties, what we then did is said, okay, what do those things look like in different transports and uh, serialization formats? So for example, we define what a cloud event looks like for, uh, for a JSON payload or for when you want to serialize the cloud event in JSON or what it looks like when it's being transported over HTTP versus MQTT, that kind of stuff, okay? But it, and the point, remember, the point of this isn't to transform people's data or business logic. This is about the metadata to help move the message from one place to another. So it's about the metadata, not the data. Okay, moving forward. Uh, 
So let's take a look at, the, at this example. Go ahead, the button. Okay, so first let's start off with a very simple HTTP request. Nothing too exciting here, a simple post, <clears throat> and we create a new item in some database or something. So what would it take to turn this into a cloud event? Boom, those four attributes. And this is in the binary format of HTTP. So basically what we did is we said, add these four HTTP headers, which are completely safe to add to any message anyway, and wham, this now becomes a cloud event. And any receiver that understands cloud events can now use this logic to do some processing, maybe filtering or routing as appropriate, without ever having to actually know that this was a new item type of event from bigco.com or big, yeah, bigco.com, right? So we, we have enabled some basic high level middleware routing and filtering type stuff without ever actually changing the business logic or the, the format of the event itself, just a couple of extra headers, very simplistic type stuff. So hit the enter key, let's go to the next one. And we, we also allow for you to define or to serialize the cloud event as a top level thing, meaning let's say you actually do want to use a standardized wrapper in essence for your event thing. We do define the cloud event format itself. So notice the content type changed from just application JSON to application cloud events plus JSON. And really the only difference here is we move the data from the headers into the body. And the old body became under the property called data. But it's still the exact same data, just serialized slightly differently if you want to actually have a common format for your event or the event thing metadata as well. All right, let's keep moving forward. So in terms of deliverables, we obviously have the specification itself that defines the metadata. We have the serialization rules for three popular formats, JSON, AMQP, and protobuf, and some popular transports, HTTP, NATS, MQTT, you can read the list there. We did come into one interesting problem where uh, because we're trying to promote interoperability, there were some people that wanted to add a serialization for their particular format or their particular transport, but we didn't feel like it was really a, a community or a interoperability transport. For example, Rocket MQ was one of the ones that popped up. And the reason we didn't feel it felt, we didn't feel it felt like a generic transport was because it was a transport for one particular purpose in mind with only one implementation. And so we felt like it was a little bit proprietary, even though it is open source. And so we went back and forth on this a lot and, and we realized that there are probably going to be quite a few transports or even serializations that might fall into this category of useful and used by people, but it's not really but, but by, by creating a specification for it, we're not really helping interoperability because there's really only one implementation for it. But we didn't want those guys to feel excluded. So what we ended up doing was having basically a web page that has a list of pointers to these quote, proprietary transport bindings that are hosted by the people that own the transport themselves. So they can still feel part of the community, but we're not necessarily promoting these at the same level as we do as what we felt were real community transports and, and serializations, right? So, just want to call that out to you because that was a big discussion point for us. Um, so the, in terms of other deliverables, we have a primer, which is basically just, you know, our ramblings about design decisions and guidance for people in terms of how to implement this stuff. Stuff that's very, very useful, but not really designed for a spec per se. So that's why we pulled out of the spec. Um, we have, what is that, six different SDKs. You can see the list there. And then we have a list of extensions. These are things that are beyond just optional from the spec. These are even optional for, to either appear in the spec at all. And so these are sort of uh, bits of metadata that we want to sort of play around with, see if they actually are popular enough to, um, at one point in the future, get pulled into the spec. Or maybe it's a, it's a niche kind of property that is useful, but only used by a couple of people. Um, but we wanted to give people a, a sort of a common community-based place to host these things and get people to sort of work on them going forward. So there's a list of deliverables there. Any questions on that? All right, thank you, moving forward. Status, all right, so we have weekly phone calls every Thursday at 12 Eastern noon, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern. We get about 30 people per call on average, which I think is actually pretty good for a weekly call. Um, from a, and we've had a total of 76 different companies participate at one point in time. Obviously, not all 76 are every week, since we only get 30. Uh, but of the 30 that are there on average, about 20 people are voting members. And that means that they participate on a regular basis, and that's how they sort of earn their voting rights. Uh, because we don't have code and it's a spec, and a lot of our work is very collaborative in nature, 
it's very hard to track people from a traditional PR type perspective. So we based it upon participation on the weekly phone calls instead. And so far it's worked out fairly well. I think the people that do end up voting are the ones who are most active. And so that, that works out really nicely, even though it is slightly different than other types of open source projects. Uh, we do have interop events typically at KubeCons themselves, but people have used our demos at meetups and stuff like that. You can actually see in the top right hand corner, this is actually going to be the demo that we're going to show off at KubeCon uh, next week. It's basically uh, simulating um, events going through a common bus at, a, at an airport. Um, and it's actually based upon the ACRIS semantic model, which is produced by the Airport Council International Group. And basically what it's about is there's a common bus where um, as people walk up to the vendors that are in the bottom part of the picture and order coffee, um, they'll get delivered the coffee. But if the coffee retailer ran, run out of, ran out of cups, what they would do is send out an event, and the retailers on the top would, would get the event, send out a, a notification or another event saying they have a delivery that needs to be made, so you've got the trucks on the right-hand side, start flying around the screen, picking up packages, delivering to the retailers, and you have, we're going to actually have the, the, the audience members for this demo actually participate by actually ordering coffee through their phones, and so it should be a lot of fun because we actually get customers or the participants in the audience involved in the demo itself. But the point of this is actually see events flying around and you can actually see the list of events on the right hand side there, even though it's kind of small, but you can actually click on those to see the actual cloud event that flew through the system. We could talk a little bit about that. But anyway, the point here is to show interoperability and how cloud events has actually made this a little bit easier and to show that it actually is being considered to be used by some you know, real world people like the Acris guys. Um, as of right now, we are still at 0.2 with 0 0.3 just around the corner. We were hoping to make it in time for KubeCon, but realistically, I don't think we're gonna make it um, because obviously it's next week. Uh, but I do expect it to happen relatively soon within a matter of weeks. Um, the, you, what's interesting is you can, if you actually look at the version numbers going forward, you can see that in terms of actual real hardcore work, in terms of new properties or attributes that are gonna get added to the spec, you can see by the time we reach 0 0.3, we're basically gonna be done. Um, 0 0.4 is all about possibly other transports, and we haven't had a new one in a while there, so that's almost done as well. 0 0.5 is just resolve outstanding issues that are just in our backlog. So really, even though 0 0.3 sounds like a low number, in my opinion, we're actually closer to like a 0.8, verging on 0.9 type of thing, because I think once we get to 0 0.5, we're at that stage now where it's more of testing and verification that this actually is useful to go forward to get to 1.0. Now, we haven't verified or discussed um, how long we're going to sit in this testing stage yet. That's going to come up when we get to the 0 0.5 stage. But I actually don't anticipate it being too long. So I'm hoping maybe within a couple of months, we actually may feel like, you know what, we're getting close to 1.0. Maybe we should start thinking about, you know, possibly doing a vote at some point. But we'll have to see how it plays out. That's just my personal take on it. All right, moving forward. Um, in terms of adoption, we do have quite a few people using it. These are the only th three that I got confirmation that it's okay to use their names here. So Microsoft, serverless.com, SAP are using it. Um, the one, probably one of the bigger open source projects that's using it is Knative. They're actually using it as the basis for their eventing infrastructure. So as events come into Knative and get shuff uh, shuffled around between the various components or even off to the functions themselves, um, they actually get transformed into a cloud event to provide that level of consistency. So that when they started adding things like um, filtering mechanisms to Knative, they can now do filtering based upon uh, cloud event metadata, right? So they don't have to actually understand whether the event, again, came from S3 versus Azure versus something else. They can use the cloud event metadata to do filtering and people can specify these filters without having to care about what kind of business logic or where they that came from or even the transport that was used, right? So again, that's exactly what cloud events was designed for, was to allow you to do that basic level middleware routing filtering without having to understand the events themselves. So in terms of plans, as I said, finish up the, the version stuff that I mentioned on the previous slide, finish up our SDK work, and possibly consider incubator status. Um, and we'll talk about that more in the next slide. When that's all said and done, uh, whether we actually reach 1.0 or we feel like we're entering that testing stage where cloud events has kind of died down in terms of a weekly churn, we're then going to shift our focus back to the serverless working group because it's pretty much the same members in both organizations. And we're trying to, we're then need to figure out, you know, what we're going to work on next, if anything. Uh, we did work on, or we started processing a, a workflow specification for orchestration of, 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 uh, of functions. 
but it kind of got stalled because most people want to finish up cloud events first. So we'll return back to that and see if, if that really is what we want to work on going forward. Okay. So before we jump to the next slide though, <clears throat> that kind of ends the cloud events specific bits. Do people have any questions? Okay. I, I know have I'm a question kind of about, um, oh. uh, so for end users, are you referring to the platforms that Microsoft Serverless and SAP? Because um, I'm really interested in who's using it for uh, application, like, um, like the end users of CNC app are usually the companies that are using the, plat the cloud platforms. Yep. So I'm curious if, um, the, you know, you've had that kind of engagement. Yeah. Yeah. So the list I have up there, I believe these, those folks have it as part of their product in some way. And so I assume they must have end users that are using it. But if you just go to the next slide and thank you, Sarah, for, being a straight man and getting to the next topic that I wanna talk about, it is when we go to incubator or when we consider going to incubator, in terms of the TLC requirements, I feel like we're pretty much meeting them all right now with the ex possible exception of this one that says, document that it's being used successfully in production by at least three independent end users. And when you have a real normal open source project with code, it's very easy to know who an end user is in most cases, I think. But when you're a spec, what is an end user? And there's, so down the bottom here, I say, you know, is an end user a product using your spec or is an end user a user of the product using your spec? And so I kind of wanted to tee this up for the TOC to help answer this question because that's going to dictate when or if we try to go for incubator status. And Sarah, I think that goes directly to your question. Yeah, and if, from my perspective, if you have products that use the spec but not no user of those that uses two products, it's not clear that the spec actually achieves its goal. Right? I, yep, that's the question. Yep. So that, that's kind of my perspective on it. Yep. Yeah. So I was hoping to get some clarity from the TOC on this either today or on a future call because this is a question that's been lingering with in our group for a little while now. Yeah, it has been lingering for sure. The, the question of what the different graduation criteria mean, well, graduation incubation criteria mean for specs, it's, it's uh, come up for tough as well. So it's definitely something we need to talk about. I'm hoping that we can uh, uh, cover that off maybe the next normal TOC meeting. I think we should have that on the agen agenda. Yep. Yeah, plus one of that. And there's also this ongoing um, issue. I know you commented on that as well, Doug uh, and, and Justin as well. Um, I, I commented on that, so maybe we can ping the TOC members to add their, um, add their opinions. Uh, I think that the end user um, point really, uh, like, I think before we answer the end user question, I think the TOC needs to decide, like, is that really the right question to be asking um, of the spec, uh, spec projects anyway? Um, what are we actually looking for? Um, as incubator status, and I, I listed a few points um, in that issue. So let's continue the conversation for sure. Yep. And as Chris said in the chat, July, June 4th appears to be the meeting that he has a schedule for. So, yep. all right. Anyway, that, I think that's the end of my cool. cloud events presentation. Anybody have any further questions? Any concerns from the TOC? I think it looks, looks good from my perspective, Doug. Okay, thank you. Great progress. Yep, thanks. Okay, thanks guys. Thank you very much. Okay, over to you, Kevin. All right, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Chris, want to give me a thumbs up? On the, all right, perfect. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, so my name is Kevin Shu. I work on the Thai KV project along with a host of many, many people who are actually on this call as well. So I want to give a shout out to everybody who's working on this project and uh, this pr presentation is for our incubating review. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Thai KV, I want to give a quick project overview and history of what we've done. So Thai KV is the open source distributed transactional key value storage layer. The Thai part just stands for titanium, the uh, chemical uh, element. KV, of course, just stands for key value store. Uh, and we got our inspiration originally from the designs of the Google Spanner project, as well as HBase. Some of the core features are TyKV is a strongly consistent database, so not a eventually consistent uh, NoSQL database like some of the other ones that are out there in the market. It supports distributed transaction. 
it has a coprocessor framework that supports distributed computing, which is actually a very powerful mechanism that's being used quite a bit to uh, essentially leverage parallel processing to process very complex data queries. It is uh, natively horizontally scalable and also replicated across geography using the RAFT consensus protocol. And a quick uh, historical tidbit, we actually leveraged quite a bit of the SCD uh, RAFT uh, implementation when we first started building TIKV about now three years ago. And now SCD is, of course, part of CNCF as well. We became a sandbox project last September. Our sponsors were Brian Cantrell and Ben Heidman at the time. And the reason and the goal and the vision for submitting TIKB to become part of CNCF was really to provide this persistent cloud native uh, database layer uh, that could be the building block to simplify the building of other interesting cool systems on top of something like TIKV. And I will go into a little bit of detail uh, later on in my slides in terms of how that has already manifested itself, even in just in the last eight or nine months or so of being part of the cloud native ecosystem. What you see here is a brief architecture overview of TIKV itself. The boxes, the labels TIKV, you can imagine them as either physical machines or disks or VMs, and of course containers. These are individual TIKV instances that can be scaled horizontally. The little region block in the middle of it, those are essentially uh, data chunks that are key value pairs that are broken up into smaller chunks uh, that we call a region internally in our documentation. And each region is replicated using the Raft consensus protocol. And right now, the, uh, just so you know, the default size of these region is 96 megabytes, but you can configure that however you want, depending on your use case. Underneath each of the boxes is a little leopard, which also signals uh, it's a uh, RocksDB instance. So uh, we leverage RocksDB quite a bit. Each TIKV instance has a RocksDB instance uh, underneath it. And RocksDB is a storage engine that was first created uh, by Facebook, actually leveraged LevelDB from Google originally, and is still maintained by Facebook, and is a very battle-tested storage engine that uh, both TIKV and a lot of other uh, database products use as the storage engine. There are a couple of uh, cloud-native projects that we uh, use uh, by default as well. We use gRPC as the communication layer between different components. We use Prometheus as the, you know, uh, basically the metrics gather of everything that's going on in TIKV. And we built TIKV using Rust, which is a relatively new system language that is getting a lot of popularity, a lot of enthusiasm. And, uh, you know, we actually started using Rust before it was even 1.0, which was an interesting bet at the time, but uh, we definitely benefit a lot from that choice and have gained a lot both working with Rust the language and also with Rust the community. So that was a very uh, fortunate choice on our part. Next slides. Here is some basic community stats that we've gathered since joining CNCF. And as you look through them, a lot of the details are in the DevStats dashboard as well. But one thing I just want to mention and emphasize is the contributor count. Uh, this is a number that I got uh, just this morning as I was uh, preparing for, uh, to, to you know, polish up the slide. Uh, we have about 150 contributors. And just so everyone knows, only, uh, so we only have about 20 people working on TyKV at PinCap, which is the company that originally started building TyKV. So the contributor, uh, I think, community is very, very healthy, very diverse, and there's a lot of other people that are really invested in building and maintaining and improving uh, TyKV beyond just the folks that are affiliated with uh, PinCap, the company. Next slides. And here are some of the other kind of more community building progress that we've made since joining CNCF. We have formalized a governance document. We have a best practice badge from CII. Uh, there are actually a lot of new features that we are working on in TIKV as it approaches 3.0, 
which is the big uh, next big version that we are working towards. But two of them that I will mention that I think is interesting to this group, one is batch messaging in gRPC. Uh, we use a lot of gRPC in Thai KV, and uh, batch messaging is a new improvement that we are working on to really alleviate some of the performance bottleneck as your system becomes more complicated and as there are more components being developed or being deployed rather in your cluster to batch messages uh, when the receiver side is too busy. We would actually, you know, not stream all the messages and actually batch them depending on the busyness of the receiver. Uh, so that's one improvement. And another one is multi-threaded RAF store. So as your system gets bigger, as you have a giant Thai KV cluster, which is how a lot of our users are deploying Thai KV, the raft communication, uh, you know, to ensure consistency and high availability does become a bottleneck as well. So we are providing a new improvement where we can multi-thread a lot of the raft communication to alleviate, uh, you know, that performance bottleneck, which has seen uh, quite a bit of improvement in terms of performance already in our uh, testing. We have a new maintainer now. His name is Xiao Guang Sun. He is uh, from Zhihu.com, which is a very popular uh, internet company. It's essentially the Quora of China, if you will, both in terms of its use case and also in terms of its popularity, perhaps. Uh, so he is now a new maintainer that we have exercised our, our new government's document to elect formally into the Thai KV uh, project. And the last set of bullet points that I want to spend a little bit of time on is this ecosystem that is already forming around TaiKV, going back to the original vision that we've had to have this be a building block. So since joining CNCF, we have discovered so far uh, three separate uh, Redis on TaiKV uh, open source projects just by folks who wanted to build that. Uh, they're called Titus, Titan, and Titia is my best interpretation of that name. And there is another uh, Prometheus metrics into Thai KV project as well that's been fostered in the open source community called Thai Prometheus. In fact, this project is mentioned in the, uh, I think the official Prometheus documentation as one of the options for remote endpoints and storage for both read and write. So in a pretty visible way, and there's more that we can do here still, this vision of becoming part of the cloud native landscape, uh, you know, to be a building block is really becoming a reality in some ways. Next slide. And in terms of adoption, we have a full list of adopters that is available for everyone to check out on our GitHub uh, repo. But uh, here are just some of the large ones that I will mention for the purpose of this presentation. One is Union Pay, which is, I think, probably one of the largest kind of digital payment and credit card gateway out there. Uh, for those of you who travel a lot, which I think is very much this group, it's a very well-traveled group, you'll probably see this logo in a lot of the fancy shopping stores in international airports as you do your transfer. Uh, Ping An is one of the largest uh, internet, oh sorry, insurance and banking institutions in Asia, is also an adopter of Thai KV. I believe Ping An Technology is also a CNCF member as well. Uh, Book My Show, is uh, probably the top three most transacted website in India. Uh, it's a very successful internet company over there and the core use of that is to book movie tickets, Bollywood shows and other entertainments in India. That's also a, a Thai KV user. And the Shopee is one of the most popular e-commerce platforms. They're based in Singapore. They're part of the SCE group, I think. And they have their business throughout Southeast Asia and pretty much all the countries in ASEAN as well. So these are just uh, some, of the some of the more notable adoptions that I'd like to highlight. And the core use case here is still a combined use between TaiKV and TaiDB, which is a SQL processing layer that's also uh, open source that speaks to MySQL compatibility. And you know, with those two things together, you have this relational distributed database that is easily horizontally scalable. Next slide. But what I also want to note is that there are a lot of Thai KV only end users that are uh, adopting this project as well without really anything else um, that goes around with it. Uh, some of the ones are JD Cloud, which is JD.com's kind of public cloud platform. Uh, LME 
is a uh, Uber Eats of China, if you will, both in terms of its size and in terms of its business. Uh, and uh, Drun Drun, the little pig in the middle, it is a, a very popular, they call it a re-commerce platform. So it's kind of like secondhand uh, commerce platform, you know, uh, people to people, similar to Let Go, which is an analogous company that I think is based in Europe, but relatively popular in North America as well. So Drun Drun is a version of that. And Meitu, which is uh, on the bottom right corner, that is a public company, I think listed in Hong Kong, <clears throat> that makes a, or started making a very popular uh, selfie filter to make you all look really pretty in your selfie. Uh, and that is not something I can speak to personally, per se, but it is also a very, very large Thai KV only user. All these users have at least uh, five terabytes of data in their Thai KV cluster, either serving production data directly to their application or to store metadata of other data. Next slide. So as we move into uh, the incubating status, hopefully with your support, uh, there are a lot of things that we are looking to continue to improve and strengthen the Thai KV project and the community. Uh, some of the things that I have listed here is to make a Helm chart and operator for Thai KV itself. So using Thai KV on its own can be more easily uh, deployable and manageable for anyone who is in the Kubernetes uh, setting. And one of the things that we recognize that there's still more that we can do to foster more contribution from the community at large. So we have done a lot of work to contextualize the labeling of a lot of the issues that we have in Thai KV, things like help wanted, or mentor, which means if you work on this issue, you actually have one of the core Thai KV mem members mentor you throughout the process as you get through it, or easy if you want to pick up something relatively, uh, you know, easy to chew on to get your, uh, you know, mojo going, if you will. And the, the screenshot I took here is a open issue still that has some of these labels just as an, as an example. So if you want to pick that off right after this presentation, I will not be against it. And the reason we're doing a lot of this is that because we use Rust, uh, you know, as many of you know, it's still a relatively new language. Uh, the learning uh, kind of curve for Rust is relatively high. And being one of the largest Rust production projects out there, uh, we want to do what we can to lower the barrier of entry to that as well by being good stewards of the Thai KV community and to bring more people into our community. And other things that we can do is to further diversify our maintainership. Even though we have Xiaoguang from Zhihu.com already, there are more that we can do to bring in other diverse uh, maintainers from other institutions, as well as having a much clearer roadmap with targeted release dates and more areas that we can do to improve. Next slide. So this is just a list of resources that you can check out to further evaluate Thai KV for incubating uh, status review and beyond that, whether it's websites, Twitter, Slack, Reddit. I've also linked to incubating PR that we filed, which I'm pretty sure has now a link to the technical due diligence document that Xiang Li from the TOC has uh, drafted uh, with the help of the storage uh, working group. So really appreciate everyone who has already done so much work to uh, do diligence on Thai KV as we move forward with our incubating review. So with that, I will wrap up and either take any questions or we can do that offline in the documents as well. Any questions or concerns from the TOC uh, for Thai KV to move to a formal incubating vote? Uh, hi, this is Sugu. Uh, one uh, quick question that uh, I just thought of. Uh, how many, uh, do you know how many Kubernetes instances run Thai KV? Um, either, and if so, what do they use? Do they, do they use an operator or do they use custom deployments? Right. So the ones that we know of, uh, and unfortunately, we aren't allowed to share uh, all of them. Uh, a lot of them use this uh, operator. Uh, as the way to deploy Thai KV along with other components in a Kubernetes setting. Oh, are they, uh, are they, uh, is that open sourced or are they, uh, did they develop their own? So the Thai DB operator is open source and that of course, um, you know, 
deploys both TIKV and other parts of TIDB. But uh, like I mentioned in the slides, we are working to you know, either work with a community or get other people's help to develop uh, operator or Helm chart-like deployment for TIKV itself. But yes, the current operator implementation is all open source and you can uh, you know, find that fairly easily. Cool, thanks. Yep. Or you can look at the chat window. <laughs> <laughs> Chris already asked the question in chat, but um, verbally, any objections to going to the vote on this? Cool. Oh, if, if there's no, um, I will go kick off the vote uh, after this meeting. Thank you, Chris. Oh. And thank you, Kevin. Okay. Great presentation. Thanks, Liz. So, open EBS. All right, thank you for uh, having us. Hopefully uh, everyone can hear me okay. Um, so this is Evan Powell and it's gonna be myself and Kieran. We're just going to pretty quickly uh, introduce the group to you know, what is OpenEBS uh, and, uh, and so forth. Um, just a little bit, uh, even before I get into this about background, the company behind OpenEBS is now called Maya Data. And if you double click on our backgrounds, a bunch of us helped uh, or tried to uh, help create the software defined storage market uh, some years ago. Um, and one observation coming out of that market was that um, something called vSAN ended up winning, which is uh, was not really the intent initially of the creators, as far as I know, of vSphere and VMware. Um, but this approach of turning the orchestrator, if you will, into a storage layer itself ended up being uh, really quite broadly adopted. And, and today is, a, is actually a pretty big piece, as I understand it, of VMware's business. So at the highest level, you can think of what OpenEBS is doing is, is leveraging Kubernetes itself to deliver storage to Kubernetes. Um, you can learn more about uh, us at uh, these uh, different uh, resources. We have been running our own dev stats, uh, as you can see. Uh, now that'll, uh, I think, uh, be over on the CNCF uh, side. Um, so there's, there's quite a number of non-Maya data uh, contributors. We are about 60 of those. To give you an idea, we have about 60 uh, engineers uh, in the organization. Mm -hmm. And a quick comment, I would say, you know, thank you to uh, Alexis, uh, thank you to Xang, thank you to, uh, uh, thank you to, uh, my Alexis just popped up behind me. <laughs> thank you to Alex uh, from the CNCF um, SIG, uh, storage SIG community and a whole lot of others who have really helped us understand a little bit better. Chris would be a notable one uh, and who has spent time with us to kind of uh, coach us and direct us sometimes correct us as we uh, as we we're over enthusiastic uh, early on but uh, it's, we've got a, gotten a lot of mentorship from this community so thank you uh, next slide please so what is it as I kind of alluded to um, and as the name suggests it's uh, it is block storage and it, and it does run within kubernetes and it does use what's there available so what could that be? That could be an existing SAN, that could be cloud volumes, that could be disks or SSDs, et cetera, that are bare metal connected. And it presents those up uh, as block. There is within the community a, um, let's say slim down uh, NFS engine that is used sometimes on top, but we're best known for, as it says, replicated block storage. Yeah, you know, it's Kubernetes uh, native in, in many senses, and so it can be deployed quite easily, quite quickly um, uh, as well. And we did make an early decision to, of course, architect it as being uh, in the user space. Uh, and that was in, in order to make it, again, easy and easy to run anywhere. And we, we tend to call the category container attached storage um, I, I will say, at times, uh, I've had flashbacks to the early days of software-defined storage where uh, 
we started talking about software defined storage and every hardware vendor in the world said that's us too. <laughs> um, so, you know, cloud native is one of those terms that um, that has been embraced by I think all almost all vendors. Uh, so we tried to define it a little more specifically as container attached storage. Um, so I, um, uh, with some uh, input from the community, uh, have written a couple of blogs about that. And I would argue that uh, Alex's uh, company and some other companies fit into that space as well. It's not simply open EBS. Um, there's a number that take at a high level, a very similar architectural approach. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Kieran who kind of will walk through the how and the architecture uh, here. Thanks, Evan. I'll uh, quickly skip these uh, two slides that we have. Uh, we'll, uh, this just goes on to repeat what Evan said. Uh, we make use of Kubernetes as much as possible for orchestration. Uh, the core functionality of the storage controllers is the one that's um, part of open EBS and th that's what we call as storage controllers or targets. Uh, those are packaged and delivered as containers and orchestrated by Kubernetes itself. The functionality that's provided by these storage containers uh, typically is what you get from enterprise storage in terms of storage management, expansion, high availability, data protection, etc. To, uh, there's a blog that uh, Evan submitted about container attached storage. I've provided the link here. Uh, so we go to the next slide, please. Uh, some of the examples uh, for this kind of storage, uh, it kind of falls into the hyper-converged uh, storage uh, topology that the storage working group uh, submitted, the white paper. Uh, OpenEBS is uh, one of them. Uh, so some of the other products uh, like Portworx or Storage OS, Ranger Longhorn. Uh, the way this differentiates with Rook is Rook is mostly an orchestration uh, control plane uh, that could actually uh, orchestrate any engine. Could be Ceph or OpenEBS also could be plugged into that one. Uh, I'll Next slide, please. Uh, this one actually has a little bit of an animation. This kind of gives an overview of how OpenEBS works. Uh, yeah, please keep clicking through. Uh, there are two personas that we have defined. One is a cluster administrator and a developer. The cluster administrator is the one that uh, sets up OpenEBS. Uh, so as part of installing OpenEBS, you start with a Kubernetes cluster. Click through, please. Uh, each of those nodes can come with uh, additional disks. Uh, this is what we call as the storage attached to the nodes itself. As part of the OpenEBS installation, we have something called as a node disk manager that discovers all these disks and makes them available for operators or administrators to create what we call as uh, storage pools. Uh, in, there are multiple pools that we support in this example. I've taken the example of a C-Store uh, pool. Yeah, please click ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so the administrator picks up some of these disks uh, and creates uh, a storage pool cluster uh, that uh, basically runs a uh, deployment with uh, a number of replicas on each of those nodes. Next. These are called C-Store pools. Keep clicking, please. Uh, and then the administrator defines a storage class that uh, allows the users to use this uh, OpenEBS volumes. So the developer doesn't have to do anything specific to open EBS, they just have to use the storage class defined by the administrators. So whenever a uh, new open EBS PVC request comes, the operators of the open EBS will launch new pods to deliver a block service. So in this case, because it's C store, a C store target is launched and a logical volumes are created on the different storage pools. Uh, click please. Uh, in this case, uh, let's say like the application required high availability and the user can actually, uh, the storage class defines uh, how many number of replicas you want and the, uh, they get provisioned with anti-affinity feature uh, of Kubernetes itself. And then it, in this case, it exposes iSCSI, so it connects uh, to the uh, through the application node via the uh, Kubernetes iSCSI PV. Click please, yeah. Uh, the one of the cool things about this is the uh, Cisco target itself is uh, completely stateless and that's the one that controls the IO. So if node one uh, goes down, the Cisco iSCSI target pod just gets rescheduled onto uh, another node and connects to the available replicas and starts serving the data. Right? And Cisco target does a uh, 
asynchronous replication. Next one, please. Uh, so it's uh, we have a Helm uh, chart available for OpenEBS under the stable uh, charts. Uh, it's uh, a single click install and uh, installing the uh, applications uh, via Helm can also just make use of the default storage class that's shipped with OpenEBS or administrators can define new storage classes and can provide them to uh, different types of applications. So one of the cool things about OpenEBS is also that it provides different configuration parameters. For example, if you're running a MongoDB, which can do its own replication, the storage class can be defined to have a single replica or actually, um, uh, and uh, the stateful set will make sure uh, that each of the replicas are on different nodes. At the same time, the OpenEBS will make sure the data that's coming to each of these uh, MongoDB is coming from different nodes. Uh, what I show here in the right side is a diagram that's actually generated from the ViewScope uh, uh, application. Uh, everything in OpenEBS is implemented as a Kubernetes native resource. Uh, so they either with custom resources or the deployment of the services that are already available. Uh, so this can be integrated into any of the uh, Kubernetes tools that we have, uh, Prometheus, Grafana, or even like the ViewScope kind of projects. Uh, getting into a little bit of a high level architecture here, um, uh, I, in the PR, I linked to a, um, a detailed architecture which we presented to the storage work group. At a high level, the OpenEBS uh, consists of two types of components, one that run at the cluster level, uh, which are basically the operator, uh, the are equivalent to CSI controller, and the node uh, device operator that makes uh, sure that devices are not used by multiple components. It basically maintains the storage device inventory management. And similarly, there are node components uh, that uh, work so for example, like the storage uh, C-Store pool that we saw is one of the node component. And in the next slide, I just have one example of how the uh, C-Store volume target works. Uh, so uh, if you have an application node that uh, uh, kind of triggers the creation of C-Store volume target, the multiple replicas connect to this C-Store volume target via a service, uh, which is a cluster IP, and uh, even the application nodes connect to this target via service IP. Uh, so even if the C-Store volume target moves to a different node, you uh, basically don't have to change anything at the application layer to connect to this data. Uh, it makes use of heavily different patterns of Kubernetes. So see, volume target consists of the uh, core data processing logic. Uh, there are sidecars that kind of attach to this that help with managing these volumes or even like exporting the Prometheus uh, metrics, etc. Great. Uh, so OpenEBS itself is a um, global organization that has a bunch of uh, different projects. Uh, so uh, in the two slides above, which define the architecture, each of those cluster level components and all the data engines are uh, available in different repositories under OpenEBS. Uh, these are the ones that we are planning to submit to CNCF. Uh, there are currently uh, a few more projects that we have under OpenEBS, OpenEBS repository, uh, OpenEBS organization that we forked and kind of used. For example, ViewScope is one of them. Um, so as part of this process, um, we will identify the projects that really belong to OpenEBS and uh, we'll submit those things. And the remaining, we will uh, move into a different organization. Um, so this is just a uh, current status. We started uh, sometime in the late 2017, and right now we are at 0.9 uh, release. Uh, we have some production users running OpenEBS at the moment. The, uh, uh, the in immediate roadmap, it's uh, mostly day two operations uh, that we want to focus on and uh, some performance improvements as well. Uh, we are getting a lot of requests in terms of supporting uh, the uh, edge use cases, uh, support for um, that kind of stuff. Uh, a detailed or um, a lot of backlog items are kind of maintained in the milestones. Uh, uh, there's a lot more work in terms of grooming them and all that. Um, we typically uh, use uh, Travis itself as a CI platform today. Uh, it does the testing and my data has set up a open EBS CI similar to CNCF CI that helps with uh, uh, testing uh, across multiple platforms as well. Right. Um, 
how are we aligned to the cloud native community? Uh, it's tightly integrated into Kubernetes and follows the principles in terms of being an open source and open architecture. It's uh, uh, scalable, horizontally scalable with the nodes. Um, the storage can be expanded to all the nodes that are in the cluster or it can be kind of dedicated to some of the nodes. Uh, it does well in terms of integrating to other um, uh, CNCF uh, projects like Kubernetes, Prometheus, ETCT that I mentioned here, uh, but even the other projects that are in the sandbox right now uh, currently. Why do we want to submit to CNCF? Uh, there's been a lot of interest in, uh, from both uh, collaborators uh, that want to help with uh, some of the component projects in OpenDPS, for example, like the NDM itself, uh, as well as uh, people who build solutions with using Kubernetes and all the other components uh, want to provide an a complete stack with using the cloud native projects and they would make feel more comfortable to innovate on OpenEPS if it's a vendor neutral uh, organization. Uh, that's a primary motivation. Um, the, uh, so far, I would say, like you know, just having proposed here, we've been getting a lot of good feedback. That's have, that has helped us to fix the governance part, for example, and uh, uh, for the license checks, etc. Uh, looking forward to more improvements uh, in terms of uh, governance. Any questions that I can take at this point? That was the last slide from my side, anyway. Has anyone had any really bad experiences with OpenEBS? Uh, so I think the concerns that have been there mostly were in terms of uh, performance. Uh, they uh, would ask for uh, how do we tune this to get more performance, that kind of stuff. Uh, and in the early on, uh, when we were using the early versions of the Kubernetes, uh, since we depended on the uh, Kubernetes to reschedule the pods, uh, uh, we had to tune the tolerations, etc. Uh, without that, uh, it would take more than 30 seconds to kind of reschedule or even longer. Uh, that would mark the open APS volumes into read only. That was one of the uh, earlier things that we had fixed. Other than that, I'm not sure of any bad experiences. We have a pretty vibrant Slack community that uh, uh, you know people come to ask questions, and we've been uh, very responsive there. The community has been responsive. I have another question, which is around the dependencies on external storage. This is something that came up with Rook. Um, is C Store your main default? Uh, so we actually have architected OpenEBS to work with multiple engines. So it uh, currently works with Jiva, C Store, as well as uh, local PVs. For example, NDM has the capabilities to manage the disks that are attached. Uh, so it kind of augments the capabilities that are provided by the Kubernetes local PV itself in terms of day two operations or uh, management of those stateful applications that are running on local PVs. So C Store is one of the components, one of the data engines that we support. We've had the production users uh, on Jiva as well for uh, uh, quite a long time because that was the first thing that we supported. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, you know, it's it's sandbox, and I think they've they've done enough for sandbox. I mean, I have I'll go on the record. I'm really worried about any storage project. You know, the Brian has left us and moved on to non TOC projects, but he's left us at a long shadow of the doubt around all things storage, and we just need to be super careful not to mislead users. Um, there is just so many things that can go wrong. I think we just need to have a slightly higher standard for any anything to do with storage. And this came up again with Rook, and we just need to be very careful. So I'd really, really like it if a few more eyeballs came onto this. I'd feel much more comfortable. I think from from all of the all of the other stuff that I've seen, it's 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 done well. And I got involved because we'd collaborated with the team successfully. I'm very happy with how that went. But it would be great to get a few more people. Maybe Shan could comment on on the storage side of things. And I think it's important to note that it's primarily different than Rook and that it's not a necessarily just a provisioner. Rook was a facilitator, whereas this is more of a storage technology. So I would agree I'd like 
to have a little more diversity in terms of which ones are actually providing storage rather than um, Rook, which is just a high level provisioner. So, because to me, it feels very much just like any other block storage. Maybe I'm, I'm missing something there, but um, there are several in the Kubernetes landscape already. So. Cool. I think we're uh, over time and thank you, yeah. OpenEBS. Yeah, yes. we'll work with, you work with them over time. Cool. Take care all. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, bye.